Okay, so today we are going to be looking at the uh, second half of the module we started last week. And last week we were looking at the idea of abstract versus realism, how we would have uh, art that's representational uh, or looks sort of real, how things would look in real life, uh, versus how they would be abstracted. And on our make day when we made the art, um, we um, created realistic landscape on one side and most of it's the landscapes you might have done something else but then an abstracted uh, image on the right side uh, on, the, on the other side and so you've got a, uh, a comparison of what something looked like if it was real or representative of what was what we really saw versus something that was abstracted and so we're going to continue with that today uh, so today we're going to be looking at um, comparing uh, abstract art um, to non-objective art. And so uh, I want to point out a couple of things. We are not going to be using the module that we're looking at today uh, because I don't like their, their the, the, the way they present uh, non-objective art is incorrect. Uh, what they present as non-objective art is really still uh, abstract art. So uh, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna kind of explain the differences today. One of the things they want us to look at that are these behaviors when we go into art museums. And so hopefully you all are um, having the opportunity on occasion to get to an art museum. Art museums, even in the pandemic, aren't too bad very often because uh, they're generally not really crowded. I think uh, uh, lim uh, visitation is limited. And so generally you can socially distance and so forth. And as long as you get your mask on, you might be, might be good to go. Um, but if you do have an opportunity to get to a museum um, or an art exhibit, I highly recommend it. These are a couple of tips, and we're not going to, I'm just going to explain the ones that are correct, the ones that aren't correct, but I'm pretty sure uh, these are the ones you want to always be paying attention to, the rules that you want to always make sure that you're adhering to. If you go in with a group, stick with that group. Don't wander off. Don't be deciding that you're going to go explore on your own. Museums and art uh, um Guys are easy to get lost in. Generally, these are uh, very winding spaces that have uh, lots of little offshoots, places where you can go. And it's easy to get separated, and, and so it's important that you stay close to uh, your group. Uh, answer a question by shouting out the answer as loud as you can. No, that's not appropriate. No, we never ever want to be shouting anywhere inside, period. But particularly in an art gallery. Think of it kind of like a library. In a library, people go to look at a book and they want to invest themselves in that book and they want to hear that or hear their brain read that book, if you will. They don't want to hear a bunch of loud screaming and stuff. That's why we don't do it in libraries. Don't do it in the art gallery. Uh, answer a question by raising your hand and waiting patiently. Of course. That's always the way to do it. Hello, I have a question. Take your time and look at the artwork. Always. Um, one of the one of the biggest mistakes uh, students make when they go to an art well, not just students, everybody makes when they go to an art gallery, is they don't give themselves enough time to really look at and appreciate each work of art. If you get to go to a gallery, recognize you might not be able to go to another gallery for a year or more. So take time to really invest and look at each work of art, kind of try to determine what the artist was trying to impress upon you or what. Um, uh, emotion, feeling, uh, or, or message they were trying to communicate. Uh, bring all your snacks inside the art museum. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Eat, drink before you go to the museum. Don't bring that stuff inside the museum. Um, you might spill something. Nobody wants Cheeto hands touching their artwork. Mm -mm. Throw away chewing gum before entering an art museum. I think this is a pretty good idea. Um, gum is one of those uh, gray areas. Uh, uh, we, uh, you know, very often in education, we like to talk about how much we don't like gum, no chewing gum. Uh, but there are a lot of studies that show that chewing gum uh, gets oxygen to your brain, and that's never a bad thing. Uh, but uh, we don't want to have that in the gallery again. If we drop it, it might get in the carpet and all that fun stuff. So always run inside an art museum. I know why they put this stuff on here. Absolutely never run. Never run. Uh, in an art gallery or a museum, you might have sculptures, things that are standing in the middle of the floor. And uh, if you're running around, you're going to hit one of those and knock it over. And, uh, 
uh, and then your parents are going to have to write a big check or something. <laughs> so never run in that museum. Always walk inside an art gallery, of course. Um, there's a nice uh, art gallery out at the horse park. They've got a lot of art out there. If you, if you go out there, you probably recognize if you run around out there, you're going to run into one of those big bronze horses or something. Look for signs and ask your guide before touching a work of art. Don't ever touch a work of art. Don't touch a work of art. <coughs> um, the artist has never ever intended for you to look at their or touch their artwork. Now, having said that, there are a couple of artists who work in a tactile experience where you might put your hands inside of marbles or some type of texture thing. And those are very rare, very rare. Almost all of the art ever created was intended to be looked at. Now, it might be in the round where you walk all around it and they might want you to experience it in lots of different ways, but very rarely would you be encouraged to touch it. Take as many selfies as you want in front of the artwork. Uh, so this is one of those things that we also don't recommend. Uh, uh, don't take a lot of photographs, uh, splash photography in galleries and so forth. Uh, but um, we live in a day and age where people like to always show where they are. Uh, and uh, you will probably be inspired to take a, a, a selfie in an art gallery. You also want to be conscientious of how that art gets represented. So um, make sure that any pictures you take of yourself are about you not about the artwork itself really uh, look for signs and ask your guide before photographing the work of course of course so here's where we get into the idea of non-objective art we're not going to look at that I know I recommend you don't even click on any of that stuff it's all nonsense that they have it all wrong and so uh, instead of going through what they've done and what we're what they talk about doing <coughs> 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 We're going to look at a PowerPoint I have uh, about landscapes. And we've, we've talked a little bit about these and, and how we can look at realistic versus um, non-objective. And so I just want to kind of review this and then we're going to throw in, uh, I mean, uh, realistic versus abstract. And then we're going to throw in abstract versus non-objective here at the very end. So uh, when we were talking before, last week, we talked about what, what realistic means and that means representation which means uh, it doesn't have to be photo realistic it doesn't have to look like a photograph it doesn't have to be photo realistic but it should be representational if it's uh if we're considering it um uh, realistic okay and then if it's abstracted it's going to have a few things that might happen in it simplification like simplified colors or abstracted colors where colors aren't what they should be like if the sky is orange or purple instead of the blue it might normally be. Uh, if the grass is orange or red instead of green. Um, if the trees are bright blues instead of you know um, pale yellows. Whatever the uh, abstraction might be with colors related. Uh, you might have abstraction in size, proportion, where things are a little tiny when they're supposed to be big or really big when they're supposed to be small. Um, we talked about uh, the simplification of shape, where the mountains might become uh, sort of simplified shapes, where we look at the most basic shape. Um, we looked at the idea of how you combine realism with abstraction. And so we look at these trees, for instance, they're rendered realistic, but the abstraction part is that the artist has put something in and it doesn't really look like it belongs, or, and that is this human face with a whole face that eyes are made by the building, the nose by that log, his uh, uh, mustache and mouth are that, uh, the, the laundry basket and the clothes or sheets that are hanging from it. And so uh, there are a few ways that we can abstract, abstract, you know, in an abstract work of art, we're going to be able to identify what we're looking at. We're going to be able to look at it and go, oh, that's a, that's a tree. Uh, it's used simplified color. The colors are probably more complicated. It's probably used simplified shape. There's probably a lot of shadow and stuff that would have made that three-dimensional looking shape instead of flat. And so we can look and see, um, you know, it's a tree though. We can recognize it's a tree. 
if we look at a simplified landscape, we might go, oh, those are really simplified shapes, uh, simplified color, but we recognize that this is a landscape. We recognize that this is a road. These are roads. That we recognize these are buildings. These are objects that we can recognize in the painting. So if we can recognize what's going on in the work of art, it's either going to be realistic or abstract. If, if we can recognize it, but it's very different than the realistic, then we know that that's been abstracted. But we can still identify that this is a landscape, this is the sun, these are clouds, all still very abstracted color. These are fields, we can even see that single point perspective as it goes back in space. So I hope by now you've got a pretty firm understanding of the difference between realistic and abstract. So now let's take a look at abstract versus non-objective. So when we look at talking about non-objective art, what we're talking about is art that um, has no identifiable object in it. So if you notice, I've highlighted no and object in the word non-objective. It's a little hyphened word. Because if we can see, if we can identify an object in it, if we go, oh, that's a car, then that's not non-objective, that's abstract. And so uh, it's important that we recognize that non-objective art is really going to focus on things like shape, color, and composition. Um, if it's a three-dimensional, it'll it'll focus on form and composition. Um, you know those the the, the, the three-dimensional elements. But we won't it won't focus on perspective necessarily because we won't be identifying something that's going to be uh, far away from us uh, because we should have an object that we can identify. And so uh, there might be. Uh, textures and that sort of thing but we are going to be able to identify an object so we look at this work i think this is a paul cleave we look at this work uh we can see that there are triangles there's rectangles i see warm colors and cool colors i see half circles geometric shapes are are abound they're everywhere almost all geometric shapes i don't see anything hardly that looks organic it's all geometric and so this piece is about the composition. And the composition is how you arrange all the different elements that you're putting in a work of art. So this is about the composition, how that artist has placed those round circles and those triangles and those rectangles and where they've chosen to put the colors to kind of get our eye to move through the painting to get our eye to look at our focal point, the thing that we might want to look at most. For me, it's this part here in the middle. All these things sort of point to that. So I kind of want to look there. I believe this is his focal point. And so we can talk about how our eye moves to it, but we're not going to talk about objects we see in it because we don't see any objects, okay? Let's look at a couple other examples. And these examples, again, the artist is, is focused on shape, color and composition. If we look here, we've got a circle on top of a circle. We've got crosshatch lines that come back and forth. We see value being created like a shadow in the back, but this doesn't look like anything. Now, I might say, hey, to me, that looks like it could be a snowman. Hmm. But that was not the artist's intent. He's just making shapes. Just because we might be able to um, tell ourselves that something looks like something we can kind of sort of see and pull out of it doesn't necessarily mean that that's the object, that, that that's an object the artist was trying to represent. And so that's an important difference. Think about it like if you look at clouds and you go, hey, that cloud looks like the state of Kentucky. You still recognize it's just a cloud. It just so happens to sort of kind of resemble the shape of Kentucky. When we look at this work, this is all about those organic shapes. We've looked at a lot of geometric shapes. This is about organic shapes. Remember those organic shapes are shapes you might find in nature, like rocks and trees. And they have real weird, undefined boundaries on the outside. And that sort of, that's what we see here a lot. 
these aren't rectangles and squares. We would go, hey, that's a circle. Mm -hmm. No, it's got this weird curve and this jagged edge. Uh, it looks like it could be a broken piece of something. These are organic shapes. Uh, I like the way they're using muted colors. And again, when we talk about non-objective art, we can talk about how the, art, the eye travels through the work of art, how movement is being used, how color is being used, texture maybe, um, but we're not going to be talking about how well an artist rendered an object. Last but not least, this is a Mondrian, and Mondrian did these really cool non-objective works of art. It's not supposed to be anything. He's looking on at shape, color, and its composition. Where am I going to put my red, he says. Hmm, where should the yellow go? Hmm, how big should this black square be? All of those things are what Mondrian was considering. And that's what uh, the focus of non-objective art is. Those shapes, those colors, textures, movement uh, within the painting or the, the work of art. Uh, and that goes to those composition elements. All right, guys. Uh, we're going to stop the lesson here and we'll talk briefly. And then we'll talk about what we're going to do for our main day.